chapter eighteen of betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter eighteen lois's engagement engaged to dunmore lane you lois bird with a hesitating flourish of a handsome new ring lois had told betty that she and dunmore lane were engaged to be married the thing which of all betty most feared so it is settled said betty in a sinking voice she sat down tense and expectant near lois lois was looking off into space she nodded her head slowly yes dunny has heard from my father she said smiling at betty then she began to laugh what a woe-begone face lois i'm horribly horribly jealous oh betty when i'm so happy yes i'm jealous and a mean narrow-minded small-hearted friend but oh lois she ran over to her friend and kneeling threw her arms around her hugging her tight we'll never be the same again dunny's first now and oh i can't stand it between a laugh and a cry betty scrambled to her feet i'll help you plan your wedding finery though then she added with a kiss there's no one i'd rather rather have for a brother friend than dunny lane lois smiled very sweetly she was even for her unusually still and quiet and to betty this was the beginning of the parting of their ways never before had lois remained so silent so indisposed to talk things over here was this intense happening and she only sat there by the window with that serene smile and faraway expression in her beautiful brown eyes now betty if you too were only she began betty clapped her hands over her ears no i won't lois bird have you recommend matrimony to me it's worked enough havoc already in our once happy home you engaged betrothed to dunmore lane i can't realize it the girls laughed together and the tense moment passed yes added betty trying to steer away from the subject of dunmore lane until she could get a hold on herself when people are deep in anything they are always trying to drag others in you know jenny walcott is a vegetarian and she's constantly holding forth on its weird beauties betty stopped abruptly but i suppose that is not exactly to the point no it is not affirmed lois with feeling well i'm beginning to feel much broader-minded now so let's have a good time planning your wedding oh lois how queer that does sound betty looked at lois as if she expected to see in the gentle high-bred face some strange transformation lois smiled gaily oh i'm so happy betty it can't make any difference between us why i believe i love the whole world better because of this and how much more i love you betty my comrade at this betty kissed lois hurriedly and bolted to the door and ran down the hall to be with her mother mother she cried falling on her knees and holding mrs baird's hand in a tight grasp oh mother it's as if lois were going to to die she buried her head in her mother's lap nonsense betty lift up your head there with both hands under betty's chin she raised the tear-stained face in a short while you will grow accustomed to the idea and we shall all have a delightful time arranging lois's wedding betty brightened and straightened up on her knees we all love dunny continued her mother and we know he is an honorable and loving fellow as lois loves him she will have a happy life with him we have both said they were suited to one another oh i have always said no one was half good enough for lois broke in betty we naturally feel no one is good enough for our splendid girl in time we'll feel just as loving about dunny and rejoice that lois has such a noble husband we can be thankful too that they are to live in new york and that dunny is no idler though he is so wealthy 
and that he is ambitious to be a first-class lawyer like his father judge lane i am glad mother indeed i am glad repeated betty as if the affirmation brought to the surface her real feelings about lois's engagement which had been hidden by the surface excitement and jealousy though a desire for an exclusive love was not a part of betty's make-up i don't want to be mean and not be happy when lois is happy but just think mother she is sitting up there looking out of the window with that contented peaceful smile and thinking of a boy betty did not try to keep the scorn out of her voice imagine me sitting by my window with a peaceful smile for jack and paul and craig she finished mrs baird laughed heartily you don't get the right idea leave out the ands and put in oars it's easy to see your heart free child at least if you can't understand the deep part you can give lois your interest and loyalty and keep from showing your disappointment mrs baird felt a lightening of her heart when she heard betty class paul wayborn so carelessly with jack and craig oh if she could only keep her little girl a while longer yet with the perfect happiness of her own married life before her mind she knew she would have betty married some day to a man she loved and honored suddenly with a shock came the omission that had escaped her mr minturn but no she refused to consider him why they had known each other only then she saw that her reasoning was not trustworthy and would not lead her to the longed-for conclusion and she stopped her mother's eyes had not been blinded to his evident admiration of her daughter betty with her arms folded in her mother's lap was looking out towards the sound and mrs baird smiled down at the fair head and pushed back tenderly the wayward curls that fell over her forehead in the happiness of their new-found relation lois and dunny's conversation naturally turned to betty look at paul there remarked dunny the old sober sides is laying down the law about something or other he's been coming here pretty regularly since the may day i can't for the life of me imagine what betty sees in him oh betty doesn't care for him particularly explained lois but he attracts her in some ways he's going to join the brothers who are working among the mountaineers in tennessee and he likes to talk to betty about it and his loyalty to the cause appeals to the strong sense of loyalty in her own nature but there isn't a trace of sentiment in it on either side i'm perfectly sure of that i'm mighty glad of it said dunny heartily jack's the boy for her lois shook her head thoughtfully i don't believe it's jack she answered slowly they are too much alike and i don't think betty herself is sure just yet though i have my own suspicions minturn asked dunny abruptly lois only smiled at him teasingly then sprang up and ran over to where betty and paul were talking end of chapter eighteen recording by holly jensen chapter nineteen of betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter nineteen the goods and the pattern life had suddenly taken on a new aspect for betty lois was engaged miss minturn was married and far away and with miss snell betty had daily opportunity to test her kinship with the one she had held up to jack so casually in the spring the man with the heart too large to remember a wrong though betty kept the fear to herself she never went to the studio without expecting to be told that at the end of the month her services would no longer be needed for very few of the former studio force remained it was just after dinner mrs baird betty and miss jane were in the sewing-room lois sat apart writing the others suspected to dunny before taking up her sewing for everyone was now busily hemming for the bridal chest 
i do believe the whole trouble with miss snell is the lack of a sense of humor said betty abruptly chuckling to herself what is it this time betty inquired lois lifting her head expectantly why to-day i quoted one of our favorite things from alice in wonderland she asked where i got that when i told her she said disdainfully i think that's a very silly book betty and lois shrieked with laughter it's hard to hold a grudge against such a poor soul isn't it betty laughed lois returning to her letter in which she incorporated this last snellism as she called it for dunny's enjoyment miss jane was watching betty with keen eyes and gave her plenty of good advice miss jane was one of those old-time seamstresses who sewed by the day they were often original characters full of oddities and curious points of view yet with shrewd common sense and keen insight into human nature in their wanderings from home to home while drawing in and out the threads or snipping the material they stored up many wholesome aphorisms rules of living deduced from the life around them these they offered freely to their customers often with a peculiar snappishness that seemed to become part of their nature through their occupation so with miss jane she did not gossip but her generalizations on the human family were frequent in weston and one familiar with the village could usually locate the source of her reflections she had watched over betty who had always been her pet and who now at nearly nineteen seemed to the spinster hardly older than the pretty dark-eyed spirited girl who used to recite pieces for the privilege of rummaging through her reticule for peppermint drops and bits of bright silk to make doll clothes with this evening betty was helping her mother with a dress for proud little edwina who had begged to have it for sunday only the swift scratching of lois's pen broke the busy silence until miss jane spoke up slowly now i think a body begins wantin life jest like fine stitch work surveying not without complacency the pearl-like stitches of her own needlework on lois's fine damask it often turns out pretty rough basting supplemented betty with a desire to carry on the figure rather than from any feeling in the matter yes i remember my dismay when i realized that things have a way of their own and people have a way of their own too laughed mrs baird as she laid down the paper pattern on the material for the little dress yes that miss snail in this respect miss jane was like that poor king george who showed his antipathies by continually miscalling the patronymics of those whom he disliked so you think miss jane that it's wiser for betty to fight it out than run away concluded betty standing up and holding before miss jane's critical eye the sleeve she had finished miss jane did not reply at once to mrs baird her mind was absorbed in her work she turned the dainty sleeve round and round and held it off at arm's length to get the full effect then she answered antiphonally and live to fight another day she always heard what you said but took her own time to answer mrs baird who was trying to make a remnant of material suit her pattern raised her eyes from her work there thank goodness she said with a sigh of relief i have made it fit the pattern at last of course it's easy enough to lay your pattern on a big piece of goods but even if you only have a remlet you can most always make it fit the pattern by twistin it this here way then that there way observed miss jane then she pointed at the goods with her shears lisbeth that there remlet's miss smell make her fit your pattern you can do it if you'll go to work and try a bit miss snell betty did not grasp the analogy yes miss shell my idea's this you know a good bit about this here decoration business she don't she's dumb you ain't but she has the say twist her round to fit your ideas you mind me betty i ain't sewed for all weston for forty years already without learnin that most goods can be made to fit the pattern if it's twisted bout enough you twist her 
yes miss jane but how in the world can i twist miss snell around to my ideas queried betty easy jess learn her that your ideas is money in her pocket she may like her own way but you see if she don't like money better something in the stiff lean old figure sitting bolt upright with the big square-rimmed spectacles pushed up on the forehead as miss jane looked meditatively at her sewing made a lump come to betty's throat and running over to her she threw her arms around her and kissed her faded hair then plumping herself down on the floor beside her as she used to do in weston she snuggled close to the knees that had held a lapboard so many years that they had grown to look not unlike one i'll try to be a good little pattern miss jane she said that's right lisbeth miss jane patted the oval pink cheek while betty's face grew bright with the comradeship which she had always felt with miss jane mrs baird betty she looks good today, ain't she said cheerfully the two women had discussed the paleness they had noticed in betty's face lately if miss snell would only say when a thing is right it would be easier said betty to lois who now joined the group and was hemming one of her fine napkins don't you ever please her asked her mother anxiously oh i suppose i do when she doesn't find fault with my work well ain't that all you need said miss jane comfortably a body's expected to do right right's part of the bargain so it ain't spoken of at the pines spoke up lois we thought a girl was mean when she didn't say something nice about our new duds or when we did a part well at an entertainment only the mean-spirited girls who watch you with cold little eyes and go around by themselves because they can't find an equal kept quiet it was in our coat of honor to tell a girl that she had a laurel wreath on her head or some such nonsense it showed that we weren't envious and were proud of her and it isn't so easy either is it bet to praise people i had to swallow hard many a time before i got it out when i didn't like the girl only those who never try think it's easy and call it flattery huh, life ain't no high-toned boardin school sniffed miss jane she turned to mrs baird as one who had gone like herself to a sterner school now lois we're snubbed cried betty let's bolt before my mother has time to answer together they ran out and scurried down the steps and the two women soon heard them in the drawing-room singing college songs to betty's piano accompaniment yale songs predominating in honor of dunmore lane end of chapter nineteen recording by holly jensen chapter twenty of betty baird's golden year by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter twenty lawrence minturn's stormy row towards evening a sharp southwest wind sprang up swaying the virginia creeper back and forth strewing the floor of the porch with its crimson leaves and turning outward the silver-lined foliage of the quivering white poplars snug in her rainproof coat betty was standing at the top of the front steps with one hand resting against the pillar watching the approach of the equinoctial storm promised by the heavy clouds and the rising waves on the bay that looks like a skiff out there with someone in it he's having a hard pull she thought anxiously and stepped farther out a vivid flash of lightning made her close her eyes for a second then while the thunder was pealing she ran down to the gate to get a better view of the boat and its solitary occupant who was pulling vigorously against the beating waves mrs baird who was closing the windows saw her and called to her to come in out of the storm there's a boat in trouble out there betty cried above the storm and before her mother could answer she sped across the road to the shore the oarsmen seemed to be trying to row towards their wharf to effect a landing but the force of the wind and the waves had now become such that he had to give his whole attention to his oars and could not make sure of his course 
betty saw that he was having a hard struggle involuntarily she started towards her own skiff but realized at once that it could not live in such a sea even if she had had the strength to handle it again she looked at the oarsman it's mr minturn she exclaimed then she cried through her hands oh mr minturn lawrence to the right farther to the right her voice carried by the rushing wind evidently reached him for he turned his boat at once in that direction and his strokes seemed to have double power his boat shot up over the waves and dipped down into the trough at an alarming rate but he held his direction steadily and in a few minutes was out of the worst of the rough water and about to come under the lee of the hill thinking himself safe he swung his boat around waved a hand to betty and called out thank you miss baird i couldn't just then an extra heavy puff caught his boat squarely on the side and completely capsized her tossing minturn into the water being a strong swimmer however he soon landed near betty and came out looking for all the world like a drowned rat but without his coolness or his courteous manner being disturbed in the slightest laughing heartily he pulled off his dripping hat and bowed profoundly really miss baird he said i must apologize most humbly for my old friend neptune though his intentions were evidently of the best he wished to cast me at your very feet but timed it badly betty joined in his laugh but broke off suddenly oh mr minturn you must run up to the house as fast as you can and get some dry clothes on your boat will blow ashore somewhere in the harbor and we can find it after the storm is over come on i'll race you up to the house suiting the action to the word betty turned and flew towards the house and with his wet clothes minturn found it no easy task to keep pace with her as they reached the steps dr baird who had seen the last act of the incident from his study window came out to meet them and took charge of mr minturn betty met lois in the hall lois come right upstairs with me she said in a low voice her manner tense together they ran up the stairs to betty's room oh lois i did such an awful awful thing cried betty throwing herself down on the window seat and burying her crimson cheeks in a pillow i can never look him in the face again whom can't you look in the face again asked lois lightly mr minturn oh lois i called him i screamed it out at the top of my voice i just know he heard me i what bet what did you call him what did you scream out lois i called him lawrence yes lawrence oh betty baird you didn't what a joke cried lois who at once saw the light in which it appeared to betty and might to mr minturn again betty buried her burning face in the friendly pillow yes i did what will he think she asked in a muffled tone then she looked up at lois helplessly lois leaned back in her chair and fairly shrieked with laughter i can't understand how you came to do it she said we never call him by his christian name as we do some people behind their backs he's so dignified how could you do it betty sprang to her feet and moved restlessly around the room well i managed to do it she answered with self-directed irony now i'll have to snub him lois smiled quizzically into her woe-begone face betty yes well lois are you going to help me out of this pickle betty did you call him lawrence because now you stop cried betty clapping her hand over lois's mouth then she added oh of course it was because miss minturn always calls him lawrence that was what you were going to say wasn't it lois laughed at betty's subterfuge and shook her head i won't say what my because was going to be but i think you know that i know betty walked to the door well we must go down now and be ready to meet him it will be all right in the morning 
i just hope that the storm kept him from hearing anyway i have the satisfaction of knowing that it was better than the snob lois dear don't you think the storm drowned my voice oh there is hardly a doubt of that comforted lois anyway i don't think he'd mind she added significantly oh lois you make it all the harder to go down well i'll act as if nothing had happened i'll make him doubt his own ears you can do it betty laughed lois adding to herself but i have great faith in people hearing what they were not intended to hear on coming out of dr baird's room minturn halted a minute at the broad landing and took in the lively home scene in the great hall below him a cheerful fire crackled in the big fireplace before it a huge sofa had been drawn up cosily where betty sat toasting her feet after her dash in the storm lois was lighting the candles in the tall sheffield candlesticks while edwina sat in a cavernous armchair crooning a lullaby to her doll minerva the group greeted minturn with laughter as he came slowly down the stairs in dr baird's clothes both men were six feet tall but minturn's breadth of shoulders and depth of chest made it necessary for him to put on the doctor's voluminous quilted dressing jacket a chinese creation that had been presented to him by a member of his congregation when he left weston betty jumped up instantly and insisted on his taking the warmest corner of the sofa now she laughed when he declined to sit down you may as well make up your mind at once to be coddled our cook is making hot lemonade for you my mother is going through her medicine chest and miss jane is upstairs looking for a stick of licorice root lois and i are to keep you prisoner here by the fire and edwina will bring your dinner to you i am sure you will find me a very docile prisoner said minturn laughingly submitting to betty's regimen the door opened and katie appeared with a great look of importance on her broad beaming face bearing a big canton bowl filled with steaming lemonade which she ladled out impartially to betty and minturn oh katie aren't you going to give me some too protested lois who had just come in from lighting the lamps sure i is honey you jest wait till i get more o dem cups i'll get them katie cried edwina hurrying after the old cook sitting around the fire they were all sipping their lemonade when miss jane came briskly down the steps rummaging in her reticule she drew out a long stick of licorice root now you jest go to work and suck this here licorice root she said bending over minturn solicitously for miss jane was as good a nurse as she was a seamstress a dubious look came into his eyes but vanished at once as he took the root oh thank you miss huffnagel i haven't had a piece of this since i was a boy i am familiar with its remedial qualities i'll save it till later as i've just been drinking lemonade he replied slipping it skilfully but determinedly into the pocket of the dressing jacket betty and lois who were standing by with their arms around each other could hardly keep their faces straight miss jane went absent-mindedly up the stairs returning in a minute with a handful of whorehound drops i heard you coughin ain't mr minturn now you just suck them whorehound drops them's better than anything else for a cough oh miss jane i'm afraid he'll spoil his appetite for dinner expostulated betty well it's good to have em handy replied miss jane as she saw mr minturn put them into the pocket with the licorice root now i'll go and see if i can help your ma about supper almost immediately katie announced that dinner was served and soon they were all seated around what seemed to minturn one of the pleasantest dinner tables it had ever been his good fortune to sit down to in the evening the storm having passed over jack and dunny appeared minturn was still the heroic invalid of the occasion for miss jane firmly believed that such a dripping would certainly be followed by serious sickness unless her remedies were applied constantly betty took advantage of this coddling with eyes twinkling she turned to miss jane miss jane i am very much afraid that mr minturn will have a bad attack of sore throat from this exposure 
she knew miss jane's one and infallible remedy that's so elizabeth a strip of red flannen round his neck'll prevent that mr minturne demurred vigorously though with his usual courtesy giving betty a look that begged for mercy a ounce of prevention young man is worth a pound of cure ain't betty insisted miss jane crisply i advise you to put it on mr minturne said betty with a mischievous smile a pleasant thought seemed to decide minturne and he replied i shall be delighted to wear it miss jane when miss jane appeared with the long strip of red flannel in her hand minturne stepped forward with the air of a courtier and took it now miss betty he said with a triumphant twinkle in his eye though his manner was perfectly grave of course you will put this round my neck since you are so familiar with its use nonplussed betty involuntarily stepped back come betty don't back out that way said jack laughing at the point minturne had scored just imagine you're pinning your favor on your knight's arm suggested lois teasingly you know it must be soaked in kerosene first mustn't it miss jane said betty hurriedly blushing at lois's words and seeking a way out of the predicament oh if that's the case said minturne smiling i'll put this in my pocket as i really don't want to be driven out of this charming assembly the red flannel rag went to keep company with the licorice root and the whorehound drops to betty's relief edwina appeared with a basket almost as big as herself filled with golden pippins which she distributed to the party all at once began to tell their fortunes with the seeds and the merry chatter continued until jack sat down at the piano and began to pound out in a manner truly masculine the strains of a popular waltz in a minute the chairs were pushed back and the others were swinging round the room by and by the piano stopped suddenly and jack called out now minturne it's your turn to grind out some music minturne quickly took his place and with much skill played a number of two steps and waltzes then on his part he stopped as abruptly as jack had done saying now i must have a dance with miss bird lane it's your turn to be the orchestra thank heaven i can't play a note replied dunny jack'll play some more you may have lois i'll take a turn with betty minturne went up to lois who warm and breathless was fanning herself vigorously but was quite ready for another dance dunny resigned her to his care and he and betty stepped out as jack struck up a spirited waltz i say i'm getting more than my share of this there isn't much fun in it for me jack cried after a time wheeling round and facing the dancers they all strolled back to the fire in the hall and clustered round it regaling themselves with apples and freshly baked ginger snaps which old katie had smuggled in while they were dancing dr baird had gone to his study and mrs baird and miss jane who had disappeared early in the evening to oversee some household affairs now came in and joined the group miss jane said she felt chilly after being in the hot kitchen and betty offered to go upstairs for her white knitted shawl to throw over her shoulders taking up the silver candlestick that stood on the hall table she held it out for jack to light then tripped lightly up the low steps at the landing she turned and paused a moment looking down the flickering candle lighting up her face throwing the smiling eyes into thoughtful shadows and burnishing the loose golden hair her slim figure in its white flannel gown stood out girlish and spirited against the shadows on the green wall behind mrs baird's glance had followed betty and when she turned away it casually met minturne's the look in his frank blue eyes made her draw a quick breath but it was all over in a moment and she could only hope that she had imagined the depth of their expression End of chapter 20. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 21 of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. 
this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter twenty one mrs lelesh has her say several days later mrs lelesh came from her country place to look over the plans for her city house that miss minturn and betty had sketched out a month or so earlier she was anxious to have the work done before winter and had consulted miss minturn about the color scheme and furnishings but the completed plan had just been finished by betty the day that miss snell determined to assert her undivided authority by detailing the work to miss rudder miss snell though autocratic and domineering had a bully's instinct to toady those who were superior in strength of any kind she bowed especially to wealth and that mrs lelesh not only had in abundance but those rare concomitants refinement and good taste mrs lelesh too liked her own way and she usually gained it by her suavity and tact to say nothing of her money Today she met miss snell pleasantly and began to congratulate her on succeeding mrs anstice it was such a privilege she said to have a gentlewoman like miss minturn to suggest and help in one's decorative difficulties as mrs lelesh's smile and manner indicated that she believed the gentle privilege had been transferred to miss minturn's successor miss snell could smile and nod most affably even while she felt cold towards the praise of her still dominant predecessor after the civilities of the introduction had been gracefully and sufficiently prolonged mrs lelesh inquired for miss minturn's sketch of her ideas for the house i am very sorry mrs lelesh but my assistant has not quite completed the plans you'll be delighted with miss rudder i'm sure she's so recherche so artistic so pardon me interrupted mrs lelesh not at all interested in a catalogue of miss rudder's gifts but greatly so in having her house ready by a certain date i saw a rough copy of our ideas and i understood that they would be finished yesterday her tone and manner clearly showed displeasure i am so sorry but you know coming into a large establishment like this it takes time began miss snell placatingly of course again interrupted mrs lelesh looking at the clock but i can't wait to-day i'll be satisfied with another look at the sketch miss minturn made out she had a young friend with her who comprehended our ideas perfectly has she gone miss snell involuntarily stiffened up miss baird yes miss baird a charming girl and very bright miss snell hesitated but mrs lelesh's second impatient look at the clock and the vision of the large check she would receive for the work decided her and she hurried off for betty and her plan betty quickly followed miss snell to the reception room mrs lelesh greeted her with marked warmth inquiring after miss minturn affectionately then she took the plans and studied them attentively asking many questions which betty answered succinctly and in a way that evidently pleased mrs lelesh she had some minor changes to suggest but in general the plans evidently had her entire approval she turned to miss snell my house has been delayed somewhat and i can't say just now when you can begin the decorating but i shall let you know at the earliest moment and i hope you will hasten the work as much as possible she moved towards the door but miss snell reached out and almost took hold of her arm in her eagerness to detain her please excuse me mrs lelesh but could you wait just a minute my assistant miss rudder has made a sketch which she would be glad of an opportunity to submit to you you will like it i am sure perhaps better miss snell stopped not knowing exactly how far she might go mrs lelesh looked at her in surprise but being a reader of human nature she at once divined miss snell's motive she was not an organizer of charities and a social leader without having gained an insight into the cause that now made miss snell's face so red she glanced at betty too 
and thought she read in her eyes an eagerness for the very comparison of plans which miss snell urged betty in fact was longing for just this experiment confidence in the thoroughness of the training she had received first with miss green then with miss minturne gave her assurance of the outcome moreover as she told lois she felt it in her bones that if she could once show miss snell that her work was of money value to her as miss jane had suggested miss snell was anxious enough to build up her business to hide her jealousy of miss minturne and her dislike for betty herself mrs lelesh turned to miss snell i shall be very glad to see a better set of plans if you have them please ask miss rudder to bring them miss rudder came in at once and fluently explained her plans and mrs lelesh listened courteously then she bowed to miss snell i thank you miss snell a comparison is often excellent for throwing light on a subject though i had through our friend miss minturne she glanced brightly at betty sufficient to guide me but now miss baird i am convinced that you know exactly what i want and i shall write to you about beginning the work at the first opportunity thank you again miss snell for your efforts but please go to no further trouble miss baird understands perfectly and i shall want her to have immediate charge of the work she bowed again to miss snell shook hands cordially with betty and walked out quickly that evening betty dragged lois off to the little bridge over the mill pond floodgate and sitting on the big log that ran as a string piece along one side she reviewed the day i tell you lois i felt like fortune carrying her cornucopia when i left the room with my rolled-up sketch accepted i could see peace and prosperity coming to the worthy baird family i thought that i could just shake that cornucopia a little and the mortgage money new house paint winter clothes etc etc would roll comfortably out on the floor and oh lois i did want to run to miss minturne and hug her and thank her betty's voice trembled and she hastily dabbed her handkerchief to her wet smiling eyes she'll soon be back a year passes very quickly comforted lois betty started up why the idea of my complaining because it's all so different now i ought to be thankful and i am for that beautiful year with miss minturne her letters are awfully happy aren't they her last one just rang out with joy yes i do hope though when our time comes we won't have all the trouble she had when our time comes betty you're so funny often i can't tell whether you are talking about love or death well i can't complain about the same indefiniteness in your language miss lois bird lois blushed self-consciously but happily and if i'm not blind lady betty your language will not long remain then she reverted to the old subject i suppose betty now that you have come out on top you will stay on with miss snell yes of course i don't believe she would give me up now and i can't for the life of me dislike her heartily for somehow i understand why she is as she is it must have been hard for her to know that everyone around was mentally comparing her with miss minturne to her disadvantage added betty justly you know that dear mother baird said that when you attacked a fault like resentment you would stir up a hornet's nest it does seem as if this trouble with miss snell came as a kind of test you don't seem nearly so cross with her as you did with poor old mr webby betty clapped her hands oh good do you really think so i hope i am not maybe i am going to have a golden year you dear thing you haven't any uglinesses to overcome lucky dunny lane end of chapter twenty one Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 22 of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 22 The City History Club Visits New York 
edwina's shrewd prophecy that mr brooks would take them to new york in his automobile was quickly fulfilled i am going to take those budding historiographers of yours to new york on christmas eve on a spree began jack who had met betty and her father at the station and was taking them home in his car they were rolling along slowly and gently and jack emphasized his determination by honking terrifically at an inoffensive dog that had strayed into the road a spree my serious city history club well then call it a pilgrimage jack compromised when he found himself master of a long stretch where he let her out a few notches as he said and betty had to grab hastily at her hat i'll take them over to new york and show them all the history that's good for youngsters of their tender years my mother will go and we'll have a bully luncheon at a terribly historical house i know of for of course you history sharps wouldn't eat in any other kind of a place oh that's just the thing how kind you are jack cried betty above the whistling of the wind in their ears but do take us to the places on our list for craig has made out a perfect itinerary for us dunny'll have to run an annex with his car i can't carry more than ten in mine and they'll be rather snug at that as long as we don't crowd your mother the more the merrier i do wish we could take at least one poor child who doesn't have sprees at christmas time why not john's lydia and dorcas that'd be jolly that lydia's a brick i know from that red crop of hers i'm afraid to tell edwina that we're going she won't sleep a wink tonight for she's corresponding secretary of the club and she'll have to send out all the notices will she worry about it asked jack solicitously for he really was very fond of edwina who in turn adored him worry about it gracious no she'll be too puffed up with pride to sleep she'll lie awake composing them the next day edwina held supreme occupancy in the book room her small glossy black head bent resolutely over a sheet of note paper was turned at frequent intervals to a small book which lay open before her its title was the gentleman and lady's book of politeness and propriety of deportment it once held a prominent place in betty's grandmother's bookcase but edwina was blissfully unconscious of its antiquity with such a well of courtesy to draw from she felt fully equal to the requirements of her lofty position as the corresponding secretary of the city history club at first betty had thought of writing out an invitation to the christmas eve automobile party for her to copy but she and lois had decided that as edwina had schemed for the office it would be as well to allow her to have some of its burdens for so far it had been a sinecure her first note was to christine her favorite christine was three years older than herself but edwina couldn't see why she shouldn't be paired off with her instead of always with that little dotty who was three years younger in a postscript she asked christine to be sure to save her a seat beside her in the car edwina felt no uneasiness over her responsibility she knew how to write an excellent note but now she wished to excel all past triumphs hence her drafts on the book of politeness meditatively she chewed the end of her pen holder if i hadn't stood up for my rights they'd never have had a corresponding secretary she said to herself now i'll show em what they'd have missed when betty reached home she was met at the door by edwina whose face was flushed and preoccupied she pulled betty at once into the book-room she was holding the old book with a forefinger stuck in it to mark a place i've been writing the notices she pointed proudly with the book towards the snowy heap on the desk i've written to every single member of the club but i'm not sure where to date dotty's letter she's so young betty looked puzzled just as you did the others oh no edwina exclaimed opening the book and holding it before betty with her finger marking the passage it says the date of a letter may be at the beginning when we write to an equal but in writing to a superior it should be at the end 
all my dates are at the beginning cousin betty but dotty's younger than i am and she can't read or write and i don't know where to date her letter betty couldn't keep her face straight any longer and burst out laughing oh edwina what would i do without you she cried throwing her arms around the important little figure i don't see anything to laugh about pouted edwina who felt pretty sure that betty was laughing at her still intent on her work she drew out of betty's arms i'm laughing because you're the joy of my life edwina looked darkly and critically at the old book of politeness but would not deign to question betty further after betty left the room she sat curled up in the big chair and pondered over it deeply i don't know why cousin betty laughed but i won't put any date on dotty's letter was her conclusion the notices were duly sent out and the club met at the appointed hour not a member was absent and john's girls ran through the gate long before anyone was ready jack and dunmore came up in their cars in high feather as though they were going to a game between their rival varsity football teams craig brought his little sister over his was the only studious face in that merry moving group he carried a threateningly large roll of paper and his list of historical places in new york surprised even mrs brooks daughter of the revolution though she was to say nothing of being a colonial dame betty remonstrated a little on its erudite contents but this is the chance of a lifetime for most of these children he protested earnestly i know craig but these sweet infants aren't working for a degree in history as you are besides as sir walter says ah dunny now you will hear the true inwardness of this abstruse problem to study history or not to study it that's the question interrupted jack hear hear applauded dunny i am perfectly delighted to see such enthusiasm over one of the greatest of men and betty turned with much manner to the cheering boys stung hissed jack as i was about to remark resumed betty turning her back on them and addressing herself to craig he says he doesn't so much approve of tasks and set hours for serious reading as of the plan of endeavoring to give a taste for history to the youths themselves betty waved airily towards jack and dunny stung again they exclaimed in a breath beating their chests tragically that's all very well but these youngsters oughtn't to miss this rare chance to learn something grumbled craig for to learn was the aim of his life the children tumbled headlong into the two great cars in a gale of merriment and chattering mrs brooks's presence did not awe them into silence for she entered wholly into their larkish little journey for the first few miles every passer-by smiled on them as though in benediction heads were turned to look after them and very often peals of laughter seemed to follow before long jack instead of giving back his usually friendly smile began to frown down on the pedestrians who looked up at them so cheerily then followed them with mocking laughter as it appeared the brooks had not as a rule found their big machine the cause of any but speculative or perhaps anxious looks as they drove through the village we seem to be furnishing the public with a good deal of fun some way or other he said to betty as two men stopped abruptly and on looking after them hooted loudly people are naturally benevolent jack and love to see children having a good time we're all laughing and it's contagious said mrs brooks looking round on the bright young faces it's mighty curious said jack as a group of boys pointed after them and jeered as they flew by after another mile or two jack brought his car to a standstill i'll bet a cent that that kid brother of mine has been putting up something on us he wanted to come along and i wouldn't let him he said as he jumped down and walked around the car examining it carefully confound that little rascal they heard him exclaim vigorously under his breath what is it jack his mother called out anxiously look at this will you 
he came around the car holding up a huge white placard on which was printed in big inky letters seeing new york fifty cents jack brooks chauffeur that's why your dear benevolent people laughed at your children who are having such a good time said jack upbraiding betty laughingly throwing the torn pieces of card into the road once started the club could not stop laughing they kept nudging each other and one could not look into another's eyes without causing them all to break into a series of giggles then edwina would poke her finger at jack's back and off they would all go again it was a happy party the dry crisp air whipped the color into their cheeks and their eyes danced and sparkled as farmhouses telegraph poles wayside inns and railroad stations flew by in bewildering succession no one who looked at them could doubt that it was christmas eve at the ferry in long island city they stopped to wait for dunny to come up with the remainder of the club and miss jane they were engrossed with the frantic efforts of two great draught horses to pull a heavily loaded truck out of a rut when they were recalled by hearing their names oh edwina christine mary bell phyllis turning they saw dunny's car bearing down on them miss jane was sitting proudly erect beside dunny while the remainder of the club members were standing up and waving hats muffs and handkerchiefs jack's young passenger sprang to their feet and waved frantically in response while edwina screamed oh we beat you we beat you we got here long ago the car glided up beside their own and while they stood there waiting for the boat to come in the two parties of girls chattered all at once and all at the top of their voices about the exciting incidents of their ride their elders talked more quietly perhaps but not less happily my but these here carriages certainly goes said miss jane to mrs brooks in a burst of enthusiasm that made betty and lois look at each other in wonder and while we was scootin along there so fast it almost took the hair off my head i do declare it didn't make no more noise than my old singer sewin machine after crossing the ferry the party drove to the home of margaret weldon phyllis's cousin she had spent the preceding summer in hobart and had helped the club in their historical studies the tall bright-faced girl was standing at one of the long windows of the brownstone house with hat and coat on and evidently waiting impatiently for the girls as soon as the car swung up to the curb she flew out of the door and sprang into jack's car amid the greetings of the party where away first craig called jack to st mark's church tenth street and second avenue answered craig we'll go there and have a look at old peter stuyvesant's grave then from there we'll work downwards finishing at the battery of course we can see very few places in part of one day and these i have noted with our luncheon will take about all the time we have before the children's festival service at old trinity so start us off quickly they rolled down town until they reached st mark's where the children read with much curiosity the tablet which related that in this vault lies buried petrus stuyvesant late captain-general and governor-in-chief of amsterdam in new netherland now called new york and the dutch west india islands died in a d sixteen seventy one to seventy two aged eighty years from there the club ran over to see the new york society library said to be the oldest library in america it was chartered by george the third in seventeen seventy two new york city is a city of changes said craig but this library never changes unless it has to it has been in this building for fifty years and you will i think find it very quaint and interesting why is it called a society library mr ellsworth asked edwina is it only for society people it sounds that way doesn't it but when it was started society meant only an organized company yet for many years it was really one of the social centres of the city 
the fine old gentleman of a generation or two ago used to meet here regularly to discuss the topics of the day and i believe the ladies too met here frequently for social intercourse and even it is said let me whisper it for gossip laughing at craig's simulated horror they passed into the staid old building when they came out some minutes later the little girls raced down the steps and piled into the cars with cries for the next stopping place this proved to be city hall park where they drew up in front of the statue of nathan hale and craig told them briefly the story of that martyr then springing out of the cars they walked sedately up to the city hall where he drew their attention to a tablet which they read with awe uniting as it did the name of general george washington with the declaration of independence near this spot in the presence of general george washington the declaration of independence was read and published to the american army july ninth seventeen seventy six across the street on one of the walls of the post office building they found another tablet which told of the liberty pole that stood near that spot from seventeen sixty six to seventeen seventy six this pole was the cause of frequent conflicts between the tories and the sons of liberty and in defense of it the first martyr blood of the revolution was shed in what was called the battle of golden hill the next stop in the excursion was at bowling green here craig explained its use for the village sports in the early days and told them that the iron railing surrounding it was set up in seventeen seventy one those posts have had their heads knocked off commented mary bell i imagine you don't know that you're speaking the exact truth laughed craig for those posts had heads the fence was brought here from england and the heads represented the members of the royal family they were knocked off by the patriots during the revolution and the lead statue of king george the third which stood within the enclosure was broken up and used to make bullets for our army but it's getting rather late he continued and i think we had better go to one place more france's tavern then have our luncheon after that we'll go to st paul's and then we'll have time to look around at old trinity before the children's service begins they spent some minutes examining the celebrated france's tavern which washington made his headquarters in seventeen seventy six and where he delivered his farewell address to his generals in seventeen eighty three then went for their luncheon ho for st paul's cried craig when they had finished now you'll see the prince of wales's feathers on the old pulpit said betty to phyllis oh exclaimed several of the girls do you think they will let us sit in washington's pew we'll try it anyhow smiled mrs brooks if they charge us we can do as general washington did when confronted by an overwhelming force beat a masterly retreat but who can resist such sweet things as you children not daring to whisper hardly daring to breathe the girls tiptoed into what craig had told them was the only surviving ecclesiastical relic of the colonial era in the city and sat reverently in washington's pew to their delight no one disturbed them and some of them closed their eyes and tried to imagine the grave dignified figure of the father of their country at their side then they examined attentively the monument to general montgomery who they had learned fell before quebec in seventeen seventy five crying to his troops men of new york you will not fail to follow where your general leads from st paul's they went down broadway to old trinity as they entered the churchyard craig stopped them for a moment and called their attention to wall street explaining that it took its name from a wall that had once been there to protect the little village from the indians then turning to the church he continued trinity parish is very old and has had a great influence on the history of the city rector street is named after its rectors vesey street after its first rector 
barclay after the second while varick clarkson does brosses morris ludlow duane and harrison streets and others were named after wardens and vestrymen aren't those sycamores beautiful exclaimed betty as they walked through the churchyard and all of it is so picturesque craig pointed out some of the quaint and curious epitaphs as well as the graves of william bradford the first printer in the colony alexander hamilton soldier statesman and patriot and of captain james lawrence commander of the frigate chesapeake who was killed in the battle with the british frigate shannon he's the one who cried don't give up the ship when he was dying whispered christine to phyllis phyllis nodded her head and gazed with deepening awe at the tomb of the hero the great organ was thundering with all its power when the club filed in and took seats on the side aisle well towards the front the church was in its christmas mood the pillars and wreathed in greens while the candles on the altar gleamed mysteriously through the gathering twilight presently the organ gave forth the tune of the processional hymn and the procession appeared in the lead came the verger bearing his staff according to the quaint old english custom behind him were two trumpeters leading the vested choir and the sunday school in singing once in royal david city the club members joined heartily in all of the service but especially in the carol that seemed to be the favorite with the sunday school the snow lay on the ground the stars shone bright when christ our lord was born on christmas night when christ our lord was born on christmas night venite adoremus dominum venite adoremus dominum venite adoremus dominum the beautiful festival closed with the recessional o little town of bethlehem and then the club members followed the sunday school in the visit to the manger a realistic representation of the birthplace of the savior at the front of the church end of chapter twenty two recording by holly jensen Chapter Twenty Three of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Twenty Three, Christmas Eve. Jack and Dunny hit her up just a little on the way back to Hobart, and they arrived in plenty of time to dress for dinner. Let us have a quiet old time sort of an eve betty proposed as she and lois were trying to answer each other's question as to what we shall do this evening i think there is more sweetness in christmas eve than any other part of the year lois said thoughtfully adding and joy too only the deep quiet kind to have our friends around us is enough betty replied while trying to keep out of her voice the sadness she felt at the thought that this would be the last christmas of the old kind the kind they had spent together for five years not a short period to them out of their eighteen or nineteen next year lois would be married the great beautiful hall would inspire christmas festivities with its revolutionary panelled wainscot white painted the tall candles in the heavy brass sconces above the deep moulding lighting the few stately pictures festooned with holly and mistletoe by the broad hearth where john had piled logs of resinous pine and fragrant hickory stood mimic pines in squat terracotta bowls a gate table was drawn cosily up by the deep old sofa before the fire reflecting on its polished surface its load of apples oranges grapes nuts cakes and candies oh lois please do stand still a moment cried betty as lois was coming slowly down the broad steps and looking around at the charming picture the hall presented you have stepped right out of a sir joshua reynolds your dark hair with that red rose those gold buckles on your slippers your eyes shining like stars and that perfect soft shimmery worthy trailing gown just like a pale rose itself mother isn't she the prettiest thing 
indeed she is agreed mrs baird as she drew betty to her side and smiled lovingly at her other daughter as she called lois purty is as purty does quoted miss jane crisply her code allowed no compliments to the face then she looked at betty and knowing that no vanity had so far spoiled her pet she added in a brusque voice i cal'late them two youngsters is purty well mated what exclaimed betty dramatically do i hear a compliment rapped it is true in a very stern voice but i can break the shell like a black walnut and get the meat within now may i come down asked lois in a small patient tone as of one who had been looking pleasant for a long time wait lois until i whisk this dust cloth out of sight it spoils the picture there now you may come down then humming hail to the chief she stepped up and gallantly led lois to the hearth betty's pretty white french flannel relieved at times by her summer silk had to do service on all such occasions to-night she had allowed herself a few picturesque touches in harmony with the day in the firelight her hair shone like burnished copper and the bunch of crimson holly berries backed by their polished leaves only added a deeper tone around her neck hung the handsome string of gold beads that had once graced her grandmother seabury's swan-like neck and now supported a rare and exquisite miniature of the madonna set in a lovely gold frame sent as a christmas gift from rome by mr and mrs anstice the big bows on her dainty high instep gave a natty touch to her appearance mother i've dusted this table at least five times otherwise she broke off abruptly as she glanced around the hall oh isn't this a love of a home and absolutely perfect for christmas cousin betty cousin betty it's snowing hard cried edwina frisking in from the kitchen where she had been kneeling on a chair by old katie's table absorbed in watching the cooking of christmas dainties then it is perfect said lois softly and betty thought she caught her looking down at the sparkling ring on her finger run upstairs and change your dress dearie said betty to edwina i've put it on a chair and i'll be there in a minute to button you up scamper a moment later there was a loud rap at the door betty and lois made a dash to see which could get there first a messenger boy thrust a long paper box into betty's hands what is it cried lois for the air was full of christmas surprises edwina came down the stairs full tilt buttoning her little dress on the way to see what had come for the old brass knocker to-day had the sound of christmas bells to the wee maid it's for you mother darling and betty all eagerness began to help untie the cord oh oh breathed betty and lois while edwina eagerly thrust her head in between them for a closer look as the cover came off there lay twenty-four american beauty roses most glorious ones on them was mr minturn's card it is indeed extremely kind of mr minturn said mrs baird holding them out admiringly at arm's length you must wear one mrs baird and lois untwined one from the others oh i couldn't exclaimed mrs baird blushing like a girl i the two girls would not listen but placed a long-stemmed beauty in the folds of her soft black net gown father look isn't mother beautiful betty called as soon as dr baird appeared on the landing your mother has always been beautiful he replied as he came down quickly and kissed her barely had they exclaimed in sufficient honor of the flowers when again the thunder of the old knocker started edwina on her best-loved task as doorkeeper of boxwood it's for me it's for me she cried dancing around wildly then she ran over to the sofa and tore open a small box oh if eyes as big as saucers and rounding lips from which flowed a stream of o's 
and frantic bouncing on the hardy sofa showed joy then edwina was the happiest little girl in all hobart in a white box on which was tiffany's magic name reposed in snowy cotton the golden coils of a beautiful necklace with a card expressing jack's love and best wishes you lucky little cousin let me put it on you betty clasped it around the pretty neck there edwina it's perfect stand off and let me see how it looks on this lace yoke again and again the knocker rang out edwina had to finish her toilet downstairs for things were growing too exciting to leave and at each knock she made a dash for the door but the climax came when a book was left for the doctor from mr minturne it was a rare edition of one of his favorite latin authors which he had expressed a desire to see he could hardly lay down the quaint little volume long enough to eat his dinner his comments were unvaried they all rang on its beauty and surprise he should not have done it i merely said i should like to see it when he told me he had recently bought it at an auction in london i cannot imagine why he has given me such a handsome gift true we had a long talk over our favorite authors that day he spent with us he's a fine cultivated gentleman well grounded in the classics yet i don't understand then the doctor would pat the precious book and meditate over its contents betty however was a little disconcerted at first but she decided that mr minturne felt as she would in his place that a man like her father a true bibliophile should possess this treasure rather than one who had it by the accident of wealth and a whim of culture if betty detected any sophistry in her reasoning she wisely allowed it to allay her questioning oh daddy darling this is christmas eve and that explains everything on such a day surprises are all the more surprising and nothing must be too surprising and christmas all the more christmassy and christmas all the more surprising and surprises all the more christmassy and oh oh laughed lois as betty took a long breath before proceeding this is the cow with the crumpled horn that tossed the dog that worried the cat that killed the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that jack built betty threw her arms around her father and snuggled close to him on the sofa peeping over his arm to look at the christmas gift to lois there had come a different reason for mr minturne's splendid gift she believed that betty's airy laughing account of the fire at minturne manor and of her own share in it had been inadequate and that her betty baird was a heroine when pressed betty had only made light of her part in the affair and lois did not feel at liberty to ask mr minturne so when this costly book came for dr baird lois thought now this proves it he knew he could not offer her a present that would show his appreciation but to her father and mother he could and besides he wants bet to be happy and takes the best way mrs baird too had her theory and it seemed to be a disquieting one as with questioning eyes she looked time and again at betty when she would not notice another knock at the door again for edwina from mr minturne had come a great box of the very finest richest most delicious bonbons a little girl could eat and with it another small box in which were tucked two books one for betty and one for lois jack brooks came soon after dinner and before long with a great deal of christmas mystery and expressive pantomime he led betty and lois away from dunny and minturne who had come with him and took them into the book-room minturne and dunny insisted on going with them but jack shut the door in their faces and immediately drew from his pocket a pair of handsome gold-rimmed spectacles young friends he began with an attempt at great propriety i have never given a lady anything but flowers books and sweetmeats i've kept strictly to the most approved formula but now i intend to break loose and give miss jane this pair of gold-rimmed spectacles 
will she object miss jane won't bother over conventionalities jack said betty laughing but she might over the expense you went to you didn't get them from a bargain counter did you for then she would be immensely tickled caesar's ghost a christmas gift from a bargain counter that would make the holly turn pale and the christmas candles blush laughing they burst out of the room and jack made his presentation speech ah, i don't know whether i'm a foot or horseback miss jane exclaimed she adjusted them carefully on her nose and peered through them trying them on everybody and everything within sight and greatly delighted to find her vision as keen as of old much to betty's surprise she expressed no scruples at their cost perhaps it was the glamour of the day or it may have been a growing insight into the fact that there were people in the world who did not have to count the pennies as pitifully as she had in the weston days even her own thrift was in betty's words on the high road to ruin for her sister's pennsylvania dutch tea-room was paying well and miss jane was filling missionary barrels for the far west to her heart's content minturn now stepped forward holding out a small rosewood box miss jane you doctored me so splendidly at the time of my late shipwreck that i felt impelled to give you this medicine chest which i hope will serve well the skill which you so generously bestowed on me ha <laughs> that wasn't nothin but thank you just the same this'll come in just as handy later miss jane made frames of pine cones for the handsome christmas cards that came with the young men's presents and hung them in a prominent place above her bureau the girls never went into her room without teasing her about her conquests and the maiden lady took evident pride in the fact that at sixty she had her loyal boyfriends everyone was remembered by everybody and old katie out in the kitchen had her side table piled high with useful and ornamental presents and the sight was so inspiring that she was heard singing her favorite hymns the livelong evening the evening was passed quietly around the fire for those who had been on the historical ride to new york were tired stories were told ancient carols sung chestnuts and apples roasted blind man's buff played and after edwina had gone to bed early so christmas would come sooner they all popped and strung corn for garlanding her christmas tree then all worked together to decorate the tree each outvying the other in the effort to express their gratitude to the little one for giving them another taste of real christmas childhood's christmas it was pronounced a great success and all promised to drop in the next day to see edwina's joy i think miss betty said minturne in a low tone i really must run over to-morrow while my grandparents are taking their long afternoon nap to see edwina dancing round her tree and i'll bring an owl i have to put on the tree to complete her minerva's outfit end of chapter twenty three recording by holly jensen Chapter Twenty Four of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Twenty Four. Miss Snell's visit. A few days after Christmas, Lois received word from her father that he would soon be in New York to take her with him to their home in Maryland, a charming, hospitable old place in the days before Mrs. Bird's early death but now deserted save for a kinswoman mrs chilton and a few servants mr bird's health and business interests had required frequent and prolonged trips to europe during these lois had stayed with betty fortunately after lois left betty had her work at the studio to occupy her and things there went along more tranquilly than might have been expected after the stormy beginnings of the partnership since the success of mrs lalesh's house for which she had given betty the credit miss snell had depended more and more on her judgment betty had the quiet enthusiasm that counts in the long run a staying power that brings success before it comes to the heavy plotter or the volatile and gushing 
the studio was paying and when the swiftly recurring interest days came they were met with a calmness that had not been the case in other years one saturday morning in april when betty reached the studio she learned that miss snell was ill and could not be there that day she looked after the matters that needed immediate attention then took a car to call on her before luncheon she found miss snell in a boarding-house sitting dejectedly in a dreary back room betty felt a shock to see her in such surroundings as she had never been asked to call she had not been there and had always pictured her in a comfortable home my nerves have gone all to pieces miss snell said as she motioned betty to sit down i need rest but i don't see how in the world i can get it the noise of the city is driving me nearly crazy it is noisy here agreed betty hardly knowing what to say as an elevated train thundered along a short distance away things at the studio must be upside down miss snell said fretfully now miss snell said betty comfortingly don't you worry about things at the studio everything is going along there like clockwork just as well as if you were there yourself they are all working on the plans you laid out for them yesterday and there's plenty to keep them busy for today so don't give the studio another thought but try to rest rest exclaimed miss snell peevishly oh yes that's easy enough to say how can i rest in this place i need quiet but where in the world to go for it i don't know betty felt a great pity for the poor woman she knew that she had undertaken a work that was beyond her and that was surely breaking her down she wished she could do something to help her an idea came to her and after a few minutes desultory conversation she arose it's nearing my father's luncheon time miss snell she explained and i want to talk with him about some things before he goes back to hobart this evening so i'll run away now and stop in again this afternoon to see you before i leave well good-bye i hope i'll be well enough on monday to come to the studio if i'm not there you'd better come here and i'll give you the orders for the day answered miss snell leaning back wearily on her couch and closing her eyes betty hurried downtown to mrs gomp's pennsylvania dutch restaurant where she took luncheon with her father regularly every day at one o'clock she went into the spotless room and found him sitting in front of the open fire while the three dutch women bustled around in hospitable preparations their prosperity making their smile even broader and kinder than of yore father exclaimed betty as she dropped into a chair at his side miss snell is at home sick she needs a few days rest in some quiet place couldn't we take her home with us to-day and keep her over sunday i think it would do her worlds of good we can telephone to mother and ask her if she is willing but you know father that she will be more than willing and with dear mother's care and old katie's good things to eat i am sure miss snell would be a different woman in a short time dr baird turned to betty smiling quizzically so you have forgotten elizabeth how she treated you when you were first associated with her no indeed father laughed betty of course i haven't forgotten but i take my own times for remembering and this isn't one of them she is sick and i well well she needs someone to help her and i seem to be the only one to do it i am very glad daughter that you have this attitude towards her yes we'll telephone to your mother at once and i am sure she will consent going to the public telephone in the little booth at the side of the room dr baird was soon in communication with his home he came out smiling as though he had good but not unexpected news to tell betty your mother says we shall bring miss snell along by all means she too thinks it would do her a great deal of good to be out of there for a while i knew she would say yes exclaimed betty giving her father's arm an affectionate little hug dinner's ready said mrs gomp coming up to them on her way flicking dustless chairs with a spotless dust cloth now make out your meal she admonished hospitably as her daughter put down the steaming pot pie 
the idea of going out on long island evidently pleased miss snell she grew bright and animated as they packed her bag and rode to the station the mere prospect of a change had stimulated her though after a short time the reaction came and in the train she sank back pale and listless jack happened to be at the station when the train pulled in and while discreetly concealing his surprise at betty's guest and suppressing his teasing spirit he took them all to the baird home in his comfortable car as the day was gusty and cheerless mrs baird had a big fire burning on the hearth in the hall there was an atmosphere of good cheer and kindliness in the whole place and miss snell appeared to fall under its influence for with a simplicity of manner that was often missing in her approach to strangers she sank gratefully down into the deep sofa before the fire saying with a smile now i can rest and i wish monday was a year off make it a week anyhow miss snell cried betty i promise to keep the studio from walking away oh thank you she began and then took off her hat just as edwina came forward allow me miss snell to carry your hat upstairs edwina said with an aplomb that made betty long for lois to enjoy it with her thank you little girl i wish you would carry my things up for me i feel it's quite beyond me to climb upstairs then run and bring me a glass of water edwina drew herself up proudly at the off-hand and peremptory order to bring a glass of water but mrs baird interrupted wouldn't you rather have a cup of tea miss snell the cook is brewing some it will be ready in a moment oh thank you tea will do very well then she added little girl you needn't bring me the glass of water at these words betty shot into the book-room edwina surveyed miss snell darkly yet with curiosity so far her lot had been thrown among unpretentious courteous people and now she was divided between anger and wonder at what kind of woman this was katie brought in the tea and betty reappeared though she could not trust herself to look at her cousin she began her duties as a hostess at once pouring miss snell's tea and trying in every way to make her feel at home though the beginning of miss snell's visit was not especially promising the next day and those that followed were on the whole satisfactory each morning before leaving for the city betty saw that miss snell had her breakfast in her own room and on her return she always took her out for a ride in the little basket phaeton through the pleasant roads that were beginning tentatively to put out spring odors and colors miss snell's temper was uncertain and while the bracing air and charming scenes soothed and quieted her she was still prickly and difficult to get on with here as in the studio betty never knew whether she was saying or doing the thing that would appease or would ruffle it's funny mother she said on returning home after taking miss snell to the station at the end of the week's visit but i have an entirely different feeling for miss snell since she's been here there must be some kind of natural religion and hospitality and i'm converted yes she added somehow i understand her at least for the minute and maybe i won't forget when we begin to tussle in the studio though betty's smile was whimsical and her words lively in order to hide her feelings yet the sick lonely peevish woman had really found a way into her big heart and betty would always see her in a different light end of chapter twenty four recording by holly jensen Chapter Twenty Five of Betty Baird's Golden Year by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Twenty Five. This way for Maryland. This time tomorrow we'll be in Maryland. Rejoiced Edwina, spinning dizzily on her tiptoes around the room. Then there'll be the next day. Then the next day then the day after that lois'll be married she ended with cumulative days and fervor betty busily packing did not answer how many are going with us tomorrow? 
betty straightened up and glanced significantly at the little pile of clothes edwina had dropped on the bed while she indulged in her jubilation your aunt helen your cousin betty and yourself if this trunk is packed if not betty looked unutterable things edwina stopped abruptly and hurriedly dumped the things on the floor beside the trunk and ran to the bureau for more and mrs brooks and jack and the kings maybe craig and of course judge lane and mrs lane betty added absently looking around not mr minturn i like mr minturn he always brings me candy oh yes mr minturn of course betty said hastily and bent down into the trunk poor uncle william can't go sighed edwina sitting on the edge of the bed as though her sympathy might take the place of good works come more things lazy bones edwina went again to the bureau but unluckily she looked out of the window and spied dotty and with the stratagem of a fox and the movement of a bird she had slid down the banisters and was out of the front door before betty noticed her absence towards the evening of a perfect june day the wedding party were driven between the two tall entrance pillars and up a long grassy roadway to lois's home it was a wide rambling structure of mellow brick imported from europe during the colonial period occupying a delightful site in the midst of a large plantation the classic round portico of the main building was impressive and the long low wings with dormer windows that ran out on each side were picturesque features and had evidently been later additions indeed the old-world custom of adding to instead of tearing down had been followed by the birds and in consequence their country home was not only handsome but quaint and interesting rows of orange and lemon trees ornamented the terrace while shrubberies heavily perfumed southern flowers trellised vines and venerable trees all had their place on the great estate a fountain in the rear of the house plashed in the silent afternoon and pigeons and birds dipped daintily in its cool shallow pool mr bird a small distinguished-looking man in whose keen genial face could be traced many of the fine qualities that made his daughter so lovable welcomed them warmly by his side was old mrs chilton a distant kinswoman who lived at bird hall while the others were resting after their long journey lois carried betty off to her favorite spot in the ancient family graveyard where under tall sycamores and cedars in a corner by the hedge she had slung her gay red hammock the few level graves of not later than revolutionary date with crumbling headstones were not neglected but were treated much as were the trees that shaded them for the history of the dust within them was only to be found in yellow faded letters in the worm-eaten chests in the attic so no sadness or mournful association had ever been connected with the little spot in lois's mind perhaps in her light-hearted girlhood the pathos of the place lent an additional charm even as the one cypress tree did to the scene here she had grown in friendship with the birds who loved its shady silences far from the treacherous stones of the pickaninnies and the sly attacks of the sleek household cats sitting in the hammock with their arms around each other the two girls swung gently to and fro talking over the months that had passed since they parted and of the coming wedding betty turned suddenly on lois i've just found you out lois you're an angel dunny says so well i'm glad your eyes have been opened at last retorted lois ever since you left five solid months ago i haven't been able to get a word out of him about anybody or anything but you lois smiled gaily without giving the least evidence of compunction at being the cause of betty's limited conversational opportunities well betty dear i should think that jack craig paul and this lawrence minturn would have helped you a little to escape from your martyrdom oh they have but you know i see very little of paul now and craig is so busy with his studies while jack well you know he's dunny's best friend and he hasn't helped to vary the conversation a great deal 
no and how about mr minturne i never dreamed you'd be so secretive betty betty suddenly stood up and became deeply interested in an epitaph on one of the oldest headstones and made no reply so you've decided not to have any ushers lois she said presently and lois rose at once to the bait as she hoped yes for i want everything to be as simple and natural as possible the wedding party and the friends who are coming from washington and baltimore will know where to sit in the front pews and as all the people in this neighborhood are employed on our estate here they will just drop in as they do on sundays i like your idea of having everything simple and that's why i didn't want to be your maid of honor it would make everything too elaborate you know betty i was baptized and confirmed in this church and my ancestors before me so i want it characteristic of my home life rather than fashionable and that's the reason too i want the church decorated with daisies instead of american beauty roses yes we can all go out tomorrow and pick them that will be so much nicer than having a florist furnish them the next morning mrs chilton was sitting on the deep wide cool gallery at the rear of the house putting strips of whalebone into sunbonnets when betty came up from the garden her hands full of roses and honeysuckle i have had all the sunbonnets in the house washed some of them are half a century old you can have a pink one or a blue one or a white one to pick your daisies in laughed mrs chilton aren't they dear and old-fashioned betty exclaimed perching a pale blue one jauntily on her head it was small and dainty edged with a narrow ruffle i choose this pink one cried lois strolling in with dunmore followed by jack and minturne whom betty had left smoking by the sundial dunny placed the pink bonnet on lois's head as if adjusting a crown of diamonds there he cried proudly i defy watteau and claude lorraine together to match this pastoral scene he added his glance taking in betty and her sunbonnet and the wide sweep of a rich mellow landscape i want to be in this picture cried mary king stepping through one of the long windows that opened out on the porch and gaily seizing on a white bonnet with a little fluted pink edging so do i and alexander king topped his big tawny head with a brilliant scarlet bonnet but dunmore snatched it off protesting that he would not have his picture spoilt i have to be very careful for my complexion is so delicate that i can wear only the softest tints jack explained adorning his locks first with one then with another finally selecting a saffron colored one as best harmonizing with his tanned skin come ladies and gentlemen it's time to pick the sun-eyed daisies before it's too hot cried mr bird coming towards them where is your mother betty there she is down there at the fountain with mrs brooks judge lane is to bring mrs lane in a carriage as she would not be able to walk so far my servants will bring plenty of baskets for the flowers so let us be going all the women wore sunbonnets even mrs brooks much to edwina's conventional wonder she thought they were all rather wild and silly and should be content to wear broad-brimmed parisian sun hats alexander king was in his element and he and jack kept the others in a gale of laughter with their sparring and repartee though the older ladies at times forgot their errand in serious consultations over the details of the wedding without a qualm lois and dunmore left their plans in the loving hands of their friends and gave themselves up to the glory of the day and the realization of the momentous fact that they were gathering flowers to decorate the church for their own wedding they were often silent and thoughtful but were ready to join in any merry nonsense after luncheon they all sat on the marble steps and made ropes of daisies which they carried to the church and twined around the dark old pillars they fastened great loose bunches of daisies to the pew doors and banked them in the deeply cased windows where they sprang up elastically as if in their own fields and then they left the church all beautiful and fair for tomorrow end of chapter twenty five recording by holly jensen